We praise the Lord, Michael Jake here, and we're here once again with the Bible Speaks Live. This is our hot topic Tuesday, and on tonight, uh, we are talking about the reimagined Jesus. Amen. And maybe a reimagined Jesus is quite possible that you have heard of one of these reimagined Jesuses. Amen. Uh, they are prevalent in the church today and in the world, and we're going to be talking about a few of them. We're going to take our time going through them. Uh, we may not get to all of them. Uh, on tonight, but we uh, intend to get through these, and, and and we've chosen eight different versions of Jesus that are dangerous, and they need to be avoided, amen, so we're going to get into that uh, tonight, and once again, we pray that you'll stay with us, get your smart device, get your Bible, uh, we're going to be digging into scripture, and once again, we pray that your time uh, spent in God's word tonight will be a fruitful one indeed, amen, and so we just bless the Lord, and we honor him, uh, and we thank him uh, for what he is doing uh, in our midst. Let me just say good evening to Tracy T. Good to see you. Dawn, Frank, uh, Bishop Brown, thank you so much for joining us. God is good and God is on the throne. Amen. If ever there's any problem uh, with any of the transmissions that you see, uh, we are streaming we are streaming uh, live over Facebook, uh, over YouTube, and we are streaming live also on Spreaker. Dot com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. That's audio only. Uh, and you can listen in there. If there's any sort of problem or difficulties in the video transmission, uh, you can check either or Facebook or YouTube or go audio on Spreaker. Amen. So that, after that, amen, uh, we're ready to go. We're going to pray and we're going to get right into this uh this interesting, I'll call it very interesting, uh, this interesting word for tonight. We pray that it will be encouraging. As always, that's that's the goal. That's the goal. We, we're we not putting information out just to put information out. We put information out uh, for it to be applied to our hearts. Uh, and it's not just information. When we talk about the word of God, uh, we are talking about that which we need to hear, that which we need to know. Amen. So let's pray and we'll get right into it. Amen. Lord, we bless you. We honor you. We thank you. Once again, you've uh, allowed us to be in your presence. And Lord, we pray that for the next uh, several minutes, Lord, that you might be among us and be the silent listener. Uh, Lord, we pray that your will might be done. Your will might be spoken. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will have your way. Lord, I pray that you might, might be encouragement, enlightenment, uh, empowerment, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give me clarity of mind, even as this word does go forth. Uh, Lord, we don't want any eyes or we don't want any ears on anything about myself. Lord, we want you. I want you to be glorified. Lord, I pray that you will have your way. Lord, I pray that you will speak to those under the sound of your word, Lord Jesus. Draw those who need to hear these words to this place on the World Wide Web. Lord, whether they're watching live or whether they're watching on the replay, Lord, we believe that there's a word here that someone needs to hear. So, Lord, have your way. Bless us together even right now. And in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is on the throne. And once again, we honor him uh, and we thank him uh, for what he is doing in our midst. Amen. God bless you, my brother Joshua. Amen. Juliana, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Amen. All right. This is a this is a very, very, uh, when we talk about different Jesuses, God bless you, my brother Terrence. Uh, when we talk about the various versions of Jesus, I wanted to start, well, I'm going to start. I was uh, questioning. I, I was going to start in one area, but um, the Lord brings me to another area. I want to start here uh, in a very familiar portion of scripture just to open up. I want to go into Galatians chapter number one. Galatians chapter number one, and this will begin, this will be the foundation. This will open up all of the other, uh, the other versions of Jesus that we will be speaking of in this particular study. Uh, Galatians, let's start in uh, chapter number one and verse number six. Galatians chapter number one, starting in verse number six. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now notice what he says here. Notice uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter one, uh, Paul the apostle equates the gospel with the cross of Jesus Christ. The gospel is is the cross of Jesus Christ. Here, he equates the gospel with the grace of Christ. Once again, they're all one. They're all tied in together. His grace, his cross, uh, it's it's all together. So he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, 
which is not another. Uh, but there be some that trouble you. Notice, notice what he says. Which is not another. He's calling it another gospel. But it's not really another because it's not really the gospel. It's a different version. It is a different version of the gospel. Which makes it not really the gospel. Because one thing that each version of Christ that we are going to be discussing. One thing that each version of Christ has in common is that one common thread. And that is that they all displace the cross of Jesus Christ. Each version of Christ displaces, removes, adds to, subtracts from. It does something to the cross of Christ. It doesn't place the cross of Christ in its rightful place. And that is at the center. At the center. Verse number 7 again. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now here we know that he is talking about he is talking about uh, the uh, the um, the Judaizers. He's talking about the Judaizers uh, that were uh, trying to impress upon uh, the Christians there uh, that it was good that they were Christians, but you also, if you want to enhance your Christianity, you also still need to keep the law. This is what he is referring to. But once again, uh, here in verse number eight, he says, "But though we or any angel." Any angel from heaven preach any other gospel, whatever other, quote, gospel it might be, a pseudo gospel, a quasi gospel, a fake gospel, whatever other gospel that it may be, it says unto, you, unto that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. When the Lord speaks twice, we need to listen. We need to listen. God is trying to tell us something when he says a thing twice, consecutively. Okay? God is trying to speak and God is trying to tell us uh, something. What has happened in the world, we, we expect these things from the world. We do expect the world to create its own version of Jesus. A version that, a version that, uh, that is, uh, that accepts their own lifestyle. Let me put it that way. Uh, we expect the world to do this, but we don't expect it from the church. We don't expect the church uh, to create its own version or versions uh, of Jesus. But unfortunately, it has happened. It has happening. It has been happening. And it has happened uh, because the church at large, and I'm going to make this statement. I've said it many times before. I've heard it many other places. Many other brothers and sisters have said it, and I believe it to be true. I've been saying it for years uh, that uh, the, the church by and large uh, is biblically illiterate. The church is biblically illiterate. Not that they can't read the Bible, but what they read, they don't understand. What they read, they don't discern. Once again, let me put this out here as I always do. Lately, I'm not an authority on anything. Okay, I am not an authority on anything. Let me put that out there. When I make a statement like that, I'm not trying to say that I'm all knowledgeable and, and, and I have all understanding of everything. No, I do not. No, I do not. But there are some things that the Lord impresses upon our hearts that we must make known. And when it comes to false teaching and false doctrine, which we'll get into as we get into this subject, uh, we're going to see that each one, as we said just a moment ago, each one of these versions of Christ lacks placing Christ at the center. And so a curated Christ, a curated Christ uh, is a, a Christ which has been carefully chosen a Christ that has a Christ that has been carefully created by those who want a Christ that suits them a Christ that suits them my Jesus is this way this way this way and this way and another group's Jesus is this way this way this way and this way and once again once you talk about this this what Paul talked about talked about in Galatians chapter 1 anytime you have another gospel there will be, obviously, another Jesus, which is not really Jesus, just like it's not really another gospel, 
because there is only one gospel, there is only one Jesus, not another Jesus, but for lack of a, uh, I, I would assume, for a lack of uh, being able to understand it, uh, explain it any other way, Paul uses the phrase another gospel, but it's not really another gospel. It's just falsehood, okay? It's, it's falsehood, it's error, and when that happens, we need to be very, very careful. Anytime, anytime that we think of Jesus as this kind-hearted soul uh, who approves of us, however we are, including uh, all of our thoughts, all of our opinions, all of our likes, and all of our dislikes, uh, we usually create a Christ that is like us, okay? A Christ that is like us. Whenever that happens, you are going to veer away from Scripture, uh, and we will be guilty of making a Christ in our own image, and that is something that we do not want to do. We do not want to create a Christ in our own image at all. Amen? And so another Jesus, another gospel uh, is something, once again, it's not really another in the sense that one alongside of, but it's qualitatively different. It is just not, it's just not the gospel. Gospel means, remember the word gospel means good news. It is good news that Christ died for our sins and rose again on the third day. That is good news. It is good news uh, that uh, that we are the righteousness of God in him. It is, it is good news that he was our substitute and that he atoned for our sins. This is all good news that springs from what the gospel is. Good news. But when we subtract any one of those things... Or when we, or when we subdue any one of these qualities of the gospel, or set it aside in any way, it's not the gospel anymore. It's no longer the gospel, and it becomes something else. In Paul's words, and this is the way the Holy Spirit gives it to us, it's another gospel, which is not another. But he calls it another gospel. A gospel that simply touts, listen, any gospel that simply says, listen, you got to be positive. You got to live positively. That's not what Christianity is. That's not what the gospel is. Not alone. Any gospel that simply touts, you got to be prosperous. That's not what the gospel is all alone. Any a gospel that simply says, we are here to be powerful. That's not quite what the gospel message is of itself. It's, that's not what the gospel message is. Amen. Uh, when we talk about when we talk about the fact of power, when we look at power, I want to go to the book of uh, Luke chapter number ten. When the disciples, when the disciples, Luke chapter number ten, uh, and starting in verse uh, number seventeen, when the when the apostles uh, when the apostles came back, uh, Jesus Christ sent seventy of them out, uh, seventy of his disciples out, and they came back and they came back raving. They came back. We would use the word. They came back hyped. They were excited. Look, look, look what it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Power. In other words, they were saying, Lord, we are powerful. Your name gives us power. And this is true. We do everything in the name of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus, because of the authority in his name. Okay? That name above all names. So that, the statement is not a wrong statement in itself. They were powerful as long as they were, as long as they were in the name of Jesus. Okay? Verse number 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. He acknowledges the power that they have. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And so he agrees with their statement. Even the devils, even the demons, they, uh, uh, they, they, they are subject to us through your name. But then, but then he gives this warning. He gives this statement in verse number twenty. Notwithstanding, in spite of this, Jesus said. In spite of this, he says, in this. Rejoice not. Don't get all hyped over that. All of that power. Don't get that. That's because 
That's not what it's about. That's not what who we are about solely. Only. No. He says, listen. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. As good as that is. That's not what it's about. But rather, this is what you're supposed to rejoice about. He says, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. No power, no glory, no casting out demons, no authority in his name if you're not saved. Rejoice in the fact that, first of all, you are saved. That's where our rejoicing comes in. Lord, you saved me. Lord, you saved me. Lord, you took me from here and you brought me here. Lord, you blessed me with your salvation, this great salvation. That is what we should be rejoicing in. Not in the power that we do have in Christ. And so a, a gospel that simply touts power only, who you are in Christ, and nothing wrong, nothing wrong with being someone in Christ. But if you simply tout that, you, you are missing the point. Remember that your sins have been paid for and forgiven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now there is something to rejoice about. There is something uh, to rejoice about. And so these other gospels, these other gospels, I put gospel in quotations, these other gospels that we will talk about, they are, they are in themselves, in many respects, they are crossless gospels. Once again, because they have taken the cross and they have displaced the cross, moved the cross from its rightful place. It's not that some of these different gospels that we will talk about, it's not that they don't, it's not uh, that they don't proclaim the cross. Some of, some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them do. But once again, it still takes its eyes off of who Jesus truly is. And that, once again, that changes the whole dynamic. A crossless gospel, in the end, wind, winds up being a convenient gospel. Uh, one that suits, one that one that fits your needs, as we said. One that fits your needs. Uh, one that is complementary. A charming gospel, okay? Uh, it, a gospel that tells you how good you are. A gospel that a gospel that uh, does not tell you how bad sin is. We're going to get into that uh, as we uh, go deeper into this subject. In the end, in the end, any other gospel uh, is a cheating gospel because it cheats you out of who Jesus really is. And it is a corrupt gospel. It is a corrupt gospel because it's not telling the truth once again about Jesus. That's important to remember. This crossless gospel, this crossless gospel in some respects, some of them present Jesus uh, as a divine uh, a therapist. Jesus is a, div a divine therapist. Uh, he is a some sort of political organizer or social activist. And none of these things could be further from the truth. Once again, that's fitting Jesus into our own self-made box. This is the Jesus that I like. No, Jesus was not a therapist. He wasn't a psychiatrist. He wasn't a psychologist. I had a I had a a, a Bible and I'm going to put that in quotations too. I had a Bible teacher once tell me in a classroom that Jesus Christ used psychology on the woman at the well. And I was dumbfounded that he would say such a thing. That is not true. Jesus did not use psychology on the woman at the well. I'm not even going to try to explain it, but he did not. He did not. Uh and so these are once again the false, the false representations of Jesus that the world and the church have created that are absolutely, completely detrimental. If you are a Christian and you adopt or adapt yourself to any one of these versions of Christ, you will be missing who Jesus is. And more than likely, you will not see the cross. Because the cross, once again, will not be put in its rightful place. So we need to be very careful. Discernment. Discernment must win the day. Discernment must win the day. Amen? The first. The first gospel. The first other gospel that we are going to speak about is. Uh, uh, the other Jesus, rather, that we are going to speak about is. Is the. 
is the religious, the religious Jesus, the religious Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about grace versus law uh, further down the road. And, and I could have put the religious Jesus right alongside grace and law, but I decided to, I decided to separate them. Uh, I, I decided to separate them uh, because the Bible does use the word religion. The word religion in the book of James chapter 1, uh, the word religion is there. But religion as we understand it, when we talk about when we talk about religion, and this is the religion uh, that scripture speaks against, uh, is uh, rituals and prayers and the other lived out aspects of the Christian life. The different things that we do engage in, okay? Uh, but when these things become gods unto themselves, then you have ventured into uh, the region of religion. Okay? These things must not become gods unto uh, themselves. Okay? And once again, Scripture speaks against these things. Uh, let's go to the book of... Let me go to Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. Romans 3 and verse number 20. Once again, a very familiar portion of scripture, but here's what it says. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Once again, we're going to get into the grace and law aspect. And once again, you could you could very well combine religion with grace and law. And, and if you want to do that, you can do that. But we separated them uh, because once again, the, the Bible does speak of religion in a good light. The word religion. The actual word religion, the Bible speaks about it in a in a different light than the religion that we have created. Okay? The religion that we have created. When when the different aspects of a Christian life become uh become uh gods or laws or idols unto themselves, then this is problematic. Titus, uh, Titus chapter number three and verse number five uh speaks almost the very same thing that we just read uh in Romans three and twenty. Here's what Titus 3 5 says it says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost amen so once again it's not about works it's not about doing things not at all it's not about religion okay if we get caught up in religion I go to church I am an usher uh, I am a Sunday school teacher uh, I do these different things in the church. I am involved in ministry. I go to prayer meeting. Okay. Once again, nothing wrong with any of those things. But first of all, make sure you're saved when you do those things. But secondly, don't think that doing those things are the sum total of what you are. It's not about the doing of those things. Okay. God does not have, God does not, uh, does not have a record of how many times, how much time you spend in church. How long your prayer is. How many times you fast and for how many days you fasted. God is not keeping a record of that. The only record, if you want to call it a record, the only record that the Lord is keeping is where is your faith? Where is your faith? Okay, and, and where your faith is, is where your life will be lived. Okay, where your faith is, is how you will live your life. The, traje the trajectory of your life is going to be based upon where your faith is. If you put your faith in your works, then you have created a religion. And there, there, that is where, uh, that is what, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? They have their reward. They can't look for anything else from him. They have their reward. Because you think that because you do this, 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 and this, that it really, really means something. No, where is your faith? That is what uh, is important. So the religious Jesus, that Jesus, uh, that Jesus is an erroneous Jesus. When we create a Jesus that will be happy with the things that we do. And Jesus is not looking at the amount of things that you do. He is not even looking at the amount of your faith. He is looking at the location of your faith. Where is your faith? Amen. Now, when it, when it comes to this next, uh, this next Jesus... This Jesus has caused more infighting within Christianity. Uh, this has caused more fractions and, 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 and factions and splits and divisions and arguments and fights 
uh, within Christian circles. And that is the political Jesus. The political Jesus. A Jesus that is a Democrat. A Jesus that is a Republican. A Jesus that is a conservative. A Jesus that is a liberal. A Jesus that is really deep down into politics. Let me make this statement, which is should be obvious from the way I just presented it. Jesus is not a Democrat. Jesus is not a Republican. We're not going to get into politics here. But Jesus is not a Democrat. Jesus Christ is not a Republican. He is not a conservative. He is not a liberal. Jesus Christ is not any of those. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Now, when we get ourselves caught up into politics, we tend to think that, of course, Christ is on the side of right, whatever right is, whatever whatever political whatever p- political party you may be a part of or that you lean toward, that's where we think Christ is because we definitely wouldn't side on the side of wrong. Listen, Christ is not a Democrat. He is not a Republican. He is not a conservative or liberal or anything in between. Jesus Christ is not any one of those things. Not any one of those things. Not at all. Now, there are there are at least three. There are at least three different uh, ways uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, politics, there are at least three different ways that that people uh, believe concerning uh, Christianity and politics. Let me let me let me go into these three different uh, ways that many believe. Number one, some believe that that government is so corrupt uh, that we should have as little to do with it as possible. Do not work for the government. Uh, do not vote. Uh, do not enlist into the military. Because the government is corrupt. That's where some are. That's where some are. Secondly, there are some that believe, number two, uh, that government has authority in some areas and the church has authority in other areas. Uh, Each one is concerned with two totally different spheres. One is concerned about the spiritual and one is concerned about the physical. And never the twain shall meet because they are on opposite sides. They complement one another, but they do not work together. They cannot work together. One is spiritual, one is physical. Thirdly, there are some who believe that Christians have a responsibility, a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to make government better. And by that I mean uh, they will, uh, they will, uh, they, they look to accomplish making government better by voting in Christian people or or high principled people that they believe can make a change uh, in the government. Th- these are just several of the different ways that uh, that those who are Christian look at government. Amen. Uh, and so we once again we must be on the side of Jesus. That's all I'm going to say. We are going to we, we we have to say we we have to say uh, from this old phrase in this old book that was out years ago. Uh, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? That's it, and that's where I'm gonna. That's where I'm gonna leave the political Jesus, Amen. Uh, and so, a political Jesus. We have to understand. Look what the Bible says uh, in Romans chapter number thirteen. Romans chapter number thirteen, and I'm gonna read. Uh, I'm gonna read a little extensively here. I'm gonna read the first two verses, then I'm gonna read verses six and seven. This is this is what Jesus says concerning the government. This is what the Holy Spirit gave Paul to say concerning the government. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The higher powers he's talking about, he's not talking about, he's not talking about uh, the principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual weakness in high place. He's not, he's, that phrase, the, the, the higher powers is not a reference to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. No, he's talking about government. Government. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So these powers, he's talking about government, has been ordained by God. God has put government in place. Now I know some governments and forms of government and people in government, I know that all of these individuals are not of God or they're not godly, but God has ordained Put his stamp of approval on 
government as an entity. Verse number two, whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And so when we resist the government, once again, the rule is, as long as government is not telling us to do that which is unbiblical, then we are to obey the government. We are to obey the laws. When government says, when, when the government says that we cannot do something that the Bible says that we should do, then once again, there, there may be a problem. <laughs> there may be a problem. Uh, but whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive uh, to themselves damnation. Verse number six. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. He's talking about taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually unto this very thing. He's talking about government officials. They are God's ministers. They've been placed there by God. I know we think that some politicians have been placed there by the enemy. Well, who's to say? But he says they are therefore they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. That means to make sure that the laws are kept and the laws are put in place, tribute, taxes, and all those things. Render therefore to all their dues. Pay your taxes. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So that's what uh, that's what uh, Scripture says uh, concerning that. Now, Jesus himself, Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, in Matthew chapter number 22, Matthew chapter number 22, uh, starting in verse uh, number 19, here's what we read. It says, show me the tribute money. This is Jesus. He says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said, he said unto them, whose image, whose, whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Verse 21, continued, Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. Once again, he is talking about there, uh, in capsule, respect for the government. Give the government their due. Obey the law. As long as the law does not uh, dispute the law of God. And we know that there are many laws on the books that are against God's laws. Okay? There are many things that are, that are on the books that we want that we as Christians should not do and and would not do. But remember what the laws are for. Paul also makes a statement later on in one of his epistles uh, that the laws are put in place laws are put in place for for crooked people, for criminals, not for the just, not for the righteous. Laws are put in place for those who would, who tend to break the law. And so the law goes up, don't do that, don't do that. And and that that is once again that's speaking about the uh the the, the political the political Jesus. Jesus never Jesus never in his ministry issued a call for political change. He came into this world and when his ministry began, he could have if he wanted to be a political leader if Jesus wanted to be a, lit a political leader, he would have went straight for the throat of the Roman government who had his people in bondage. They were under, the Jews were under Rome. And this is where even some of the disciples thought that Jesus was going when he was talking about his kingdom. They thought that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom on earth. This is why the Jews uh, that were not his disciples, this is why many of them rejected him because he's, he comes along talking about love and peace and and, and forgiving. And, and they didn't want to hear that. They wanted freedom from their oppressors. And that's not why Jesus came. That is not why Jesus came. And so we, we must we must take that uh, into account. Uh, in John chapter number 6, in John chapter number 6, uh, and verse number, John 6 and verse number 14, we read something very interesting. John 6 and verse number 14, here's what it says. This is after Jesus, uh, after the, the miracle uh, of the loaves and fishes. In verse number 14 of John 6, it says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived 
that they would come and take him by force to make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. They wanted to politicize what Jesus did. They wanted to make him king. He turned them down. They didn't get to him, but before they could get to him, of course, Jesus knew what they were thinking, and Jesus got himself out. They wanted to make him king. If that was the case, he would have said, anoint me, crown me. We'll, we'll do a number on the Roman people. We'll get together. We'll, we'll make an army. That's not what Jesus was about. That is not what Jesus was about at all. Amen. We read about Jesus' ministry in Matthew, in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse number 18, we read about Jesus' ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is what Christ's ministry was. This is what Christ's ministry was. And so Jesus was not here uh, for the sake of uh, politics at all. Not at all. Jesus was not here for the sake of politics. Thirdly, we see another Jesus, another version of Jesus, which is erroneous, but it is, it is a Jesus that has been created. And this is the tolerant Jesus. The tolerant Jesus. Who is the tolerant Jesus? Well, the tolerant Jesus is the Jesus that is promoted by those within uh the kingdom now movement or dominion theology. This is the tolerant Jesus. Why is he a tolerant Jesus? Because this is the Jesus that will sit back and wait until the church uh, is ready, until the church has the world in its place, and then we will tell Jesus when he can come. And that is a Jesus that is tolerant. Okay? Uh, a tolerant Jesus. Uh, actually, that is, I'm sorry, that is the passive Jesus. I got the two mixed up. You can mix them together, but that is that is a passive Jesus. The Jesus that who will just sit back and wait for the church to be ready, readied by the church, and now Jesus, now you can come and take over and have dominion over the rest of the world. That's a passive Jesus. Jesus is not waiting for anyone. Jesus is not waiting for anything. Okay, he is. Th th that is. Those are not the things that he is waiting for. The whole idea of dominion theology, which has morphed into uh, kingdom theology, it's all based on Genesis chapter one and verse number twenty-eight. Dominion theology, which once again has morphed into kingdom now or kingdom theology. All begins in Romans, a misunderstanding, a twisting of Romans chapter 1 and verse number 28. Here's what, here's what Romans chapter 1 and verse number 28 says. It says, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now where does it say? Where does it say anywhere in that verse that we are or the church is or whoever is supposed to have dominion over people? That is not what the go the gospel is not about taking dominion over the planet earth. That is not what the gospel is about. Jesus said, go and tell, go and proclaim the gospel, make disciples of every nation. That's what Jesus said to do. He didn't say, go and take dominion over the world. This is not what Jesus said. But once again, dominion theology has, has created this passive Jesus, gives all the power to the people, go do this, go put Christians in every strata of society, and once Christianity is in every strata of society and we have dominion over the world, now Jesus can come and he can set up his kingdom. They don't believe in a rapture, okay? Uh, the rapture does not exist in dominion theology. That's not a rapture that they speak of when they want Jesus to come. They're not talking about a rapture. 
He will just come and start his kingdom, which they have put in place for him. That's not the gospel. And that is a Jesus that is foreign to the scriptures. And so we need to be very, very uh, careful. We do not tell Jesus when he can return. No man knows the day or the hour. The Bible does speak about a rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. We won't read that. I'm sure you under, you know where that is. But the Bible does speak that Jesus will come. That he will come unexpectedly. We do believe that Jesus' return is imminent. We do believe that he can come anytime. He is not waiting for us to accomplish something here on earth in order for him to come. So that Jesus, this, this passive Jesus just sitting around and waiting for us to do what we're supposed to do, that's not a Jesus. That's not the real Jesus. That's another Jesus. And that Jesus must be rejected. Once again, that's putting the cross in another place. There's no talk of the cross. They don't speak of the cross. Dominion theology says that the cross was a... Many within Dominion theology say that the cross was a sign of weakness. It was a sign of weakness. No, 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 no. So you see, once again... When we adopt any one of these types of Jesus, one of these versions of Jesus, we do damage. We do damage to the message of the gospel. And the cross, once again, is totally put aside. It's totally put aside. Next, we will talk about this tolerant Jesus that we spoke of just a moment ago. The tolerant Jesus. Now, the tolerant Jesus is a Jesus that puts up with our sin. Because this Jesus, this Jesus, if we speak of our sin, if we bring up our sin to this Jesus, it is an affront to him. It is it is a slap in the face of the Jesus who has forgiven all of our sins, past, present, and future. We don't even need to bring up our sins. We don't even need to tell we don't even need to ask for forgiveness because our sins are already forgiven. And for me to bring it up gives not only a slap in the face to Christ who has forgiven me of everything, but it is also uh, it is also giving myself a sin consciousness. Don't worry about sin that you commit in this life. Don't it's already finished. It's forgiven. That is not Jesus. That is diabolical. Okay? Any Jesus, any Jesus that says, listen, you don't have to ask me for forgiveness because I've already forgiven you of everything. That's not Jesus. That is not Jesus at all. And so once again, that is a Jesus that should be avoided. Let me read from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to be reading verse number 15, starting in verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Starting in verse number 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The Christian life is about holiness. We are to be, our ultimate goal is to be like Christ. He was holy. You will not be holy if you do not confess your sins. You are not being holy. And there have been many that have been shipwrecked. There are many, there are many that have been ruined, spiritually at least, because they have adopted this version of Jesus who says everything is forgiven. But yet and still, if they are truly a Christian, if they are truly a Christian and they begin to adopt this, the Holy Spirit is going to bring conviction. But they're taught that that conviction is the, is, is the Holy Spirit convicting you of righteousness, not of sin. So once again, this is diabolical, detrimental, and deceptive. It's a lie. It's a lie. And so this Jesus also ends up being a, a, a Jesus that is to be avoided. This Tolerant Jesus. Amen. We're going to stop right there uh, on tonight. Now we've spoken about the religious Jesus, the political Jesus, 
the tolerant Jesus, and the passive Jesus. There are yet four more versions of Jesus that we need to get into, and we'll get into those the next time we come together, Lord willing. Amen? But these four are enough that we once again need to keep our spiritual antenna up. We need to make sure that we read the word. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. You got to be careful. You got to be careful. Because at a church near you, at a church near you, there may be so there may be those who are into any one of these versions of Jesus. And they will do their best to promote these versions of Jesus. But if you know the word and you stand upon the word and you ask the Holy Spirit for discernment, you won't be a victim of any one of these versions of Jesus. Amen. That is important. I have a question. Frank says, doesn't the Lord judge, save people, what we did for the Lord or rewards in heaven? Oh yes, we will, we will get uh, rewards. We will definitely get rewards uh, in heaven. And, and what we said earlier does not mean that we don't go ahead and do the things that we do. We do because we love. We do because we have a passion. We do because we have a burden for people, uh, for the people of God, for the people in the world. This is why we do. We are not doing to gain anything. Okay? The, the, the rewards that we will receive, that the, the scripture speaks about, these are what I will call fringe benefits. But we're not working at it. I'm going to work so I can get my crown. I'm going to work so I can get the crown of life and the crown of righteousness. I'm going to work for No, that's not what we are doing. So yes, when you are in Christ, your desires will be changed and you want to do for the Lord. And you will do for the Lord. The Lord is going to call you. The Lord is going to call you into ministry of some kind, more than likely. And you will be doing something. But once again, we must keep, uh, we must keep our, uh, uh, the, 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 the purposes of what we do in the right place. We are not trying, we are not trying to gain anything. I'm going to do so that the Lord can know. So we do. We will get rewards for what we do. He will take our motives into account even there. Uh, but we must make sure that we don't work and do just to get. We do because we love. We do because we desire. Okay, that's that's what's important. Amen. So I, I bless the Lord and I thank him once again. Uh, for giving us this opportunity. Frank says, can you give me some examples of a false gospel? We've given you some. We've given you some. Uh, and and we will, we, we, we have, there are so many false gospels out there. Uh, we've given you, uh, we've given you the, uh, the kingdom now. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into the word of faith a little bit. Uh, the grace revolution, which we what we were just our last point, that's talking about the grace revolution. These are all false gospels. These are the other gospels that Galatians speaks of. Okay, it's not just about the law. You talk about the law specifically, but any other gospel that misplaces, displaces Christ and who He was and who He is. It's a false gospel. Amen. Lord, we bless you tonight. We thank you once again. You've given us this opportunity to open up your word. Time has gone by so quickly, Lord. But Lord, we pray that this time, uh, this time spent in your word, we pray that it has been, uh, that it has been a good time, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that the words that we speak, Lord, I pray that you will allow these words to be in our hearts, the word uh, that will be in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. Lord, we want to make sure that you have your way. Lord, speak to us, Lord Jesus. Have your way. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Next week, we're going to, next week we're going to uh, get into the second half, the second part uh, of this. Uh, so we pray that you will join us at this time, at that time. God bless you, my brother Terrence and Dawn and Frank, Thomas Walker, amen, in Mississippi. God bless you. Tracy T, amen. God bless you all. Joshua Tatum, amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, God is on the throne. We just bless the Lord. And we thank him uh, for what he is doing. Bishop Brown, thank you very much for being here. Juliana, thank you so much for coming by. 
Uh, Tangi, thank you so much for being here. God is good. God is on the throne. And we just honor him and bless him and thank him for what he is doing. Let me just say uh, that tomorrow night we'll be here uh, once again, Lord willing. And tomorrow night we're going to uh, we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to continue uh, speaking uh, about the defeated devil. Amen. The defeated devil. That'll be part. Uh, gee, I forgot which part it is, but we're going to continue. Uh, uh, looking at the defeated devil, amen, what the cross did to the devil, amen, so join us if you can, that'll be tomorrow night uh, at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, amen, so with that, we're going to say good night, thank you for joining us, and once again, if you're watching us over Facebook, don't forget to share out this page, uh, you can also go to our website at that's the word org. Uh, you can also go to our YouTube channel, that's the word ministries, you can also go over to spreaker.com, that is our that is our podcast platform. Uh, you can listen in there. Amen. So once again, we thank the Lord for what he is doing. And I thank you for being here. Until the next time, may God bless.